Hello and welcome to uh, revision tips for SIPS Level 3 Advanced Certificate in Procurement and Supply Operations, Module 2, which is Ethical Procurement and Supply. And this is going to cover Learning Outcome 2, which is to know the tasks associated with each stage of the sourcing process. So we'll cover things like how procurement needs are established, criteria to apply in creating specifications, the approaches you can take to sourcing and the formation of agreements with suppliers. <clears throat> so let's start with some definitions. A need, what is a need? A need is either a tangible or intangible requirement that can be um, identified by an individual in an organisation. A tangible need is something physical that you need and you can see and touch. Intangible would probably be a service that you couldn't physically see and touch. But in all cases, the buyer will need to engage with the user at some point to understand the needs. That could be external customers, so people outside of your organisation that are paying for orders. Or an internal customer, people or departments that were within our organisation that are asking for needs to be met. So needs can arrive in procurement either manually, a conversation, some sort of electronic form. Or if you're a manufacturer, you may be using a system called MRP, which is Materials Requirement Planning in which case the um, requisition and need will be automatically identified. But when a need gets identified, procurement will always review the need just to make sure that it's justified. And you may need to liaise with your customer or stakeholder at that point. The second thing is we'll evaluate if any economies of scale will, um, will possibly reduce the price that we pay. And we may even cancel orders because um, we know that the, the need can already be met by something we've got internally. But the buyer should always liaise with the customer who raised the requisition before making any adjustments or cancellations. The main needs is broken down into further needs, but you can essentially see the needs process flow on the slide in front of you, which helps us to sort of, I guess, understand the need, notify us of the need, we then review it, source it, order it and so on. Um, but those needs can then span into more than just one, one order. It could be multiple things that are needed to satisfy the end result. Now, when we're reviewing the needs from the customers, it's important for procurement to always think about um, the need that's been put in front of them. It doesn't mean the buyer doesn't trust the customer, but sometimes we've got the knowledge that may result in us amending or even cancelling the order. So situations that occur could be that the buyer knows um, the need is already available somewhere else in the business. The product that they're trying to buy is obsolete, which means that it's got no sort of future use or need. Um, you may be able to get economies of scale if you put that particular requirement with an order from another department to get a bulk purchase discount. If you're aware that the need could be met in an alternative way, like um, LED bulbs, possibly instead of buying um, bog standard ordinary light bulbs. Or it may just be that the need's not justified. They're asking for something that just isn't, um, isn't viable or reasonable. Now, a decision that um, most organisations are faced with when they're looking at buying things from an external supplier is this make or buy decision that you can see on the screen. And this is a decision that an organisation makes about whether or not to produce the goods themselves or deliver a service themselves or service it from using an external supplier. So the matrix you can see on the screen can help you to make that decision by plotting the strategic importance against the operational importance and this is from high to low so the decision about whether to make or buy is based on where it sits in that grid so products that sit in the bottom left quadrant low risk to outsourcing or buying would be sourced from a supplier products that sit in the top right high risk of outsourcing should be brought in-house or retained in-house so what might be some of the reasons why we would we would um engage with an external supplier. It may be because it's more expensive for us to do that um, product or service ourselves, so it's cheaper to go outside. We don't necessarily have the relevant expertise to do it ourselves. 
or it would require us to um, have some significant investment in machinery or something like that to set up, which we don't have the money to do. It could be because we are um, expecting some type of demand fluctuation. Um, so, for example, deliveries might be more busy at Christmas time than any other time of the year. So you'd end up with um, capacity of workforce doing nothing otherwise in those uh, lower activity months. It could be because the products aren't strategically important to you. Or if you prefer to concentrate your internal resources on areas of special need. So I think primarily you outsource something if um, a third party can do it better and cheaper than you. Now the characteristics of outsourced services is um, it's an in-house um, activity that was previously done in-house that you then transfer to a third party. The assets and knowledge are sent to that external party as well, which makes it really difficult for you to bring it back in-house at a later date. Um, for that reason, generally the, the, the relationships are tech, tend to be long term, like multiple years. But you are then exposed to new risk and cost profiles that you perhaps hadn't been exposed to before. Now, assuming you've made the decision that you are going to um, outsource and, and involve a third party, you are going to need to write a specification, which I often say to you is the heart of the contract, because when things don't go according to plan, the first document we rely on is the specification to see what did we ask for. And I think they're integral. There are two types of specifications. We've got performance, which are also known as outcome based specifications and conformance, which are also known as technical specifications. Your performance or outcome spec will outline what the product or service is to do or achieve and that will allow the supplier to um, have an element of innovation to be able to say how the, the service or product should be delivered. To be honest with you, performance specs are usually services. So you allow various options on a requirement to be considered, promoting innovation and competition within the marketplace. Often known as output or outcome based, and you'll use it in things like facilities management, cleaning, catering, um, giving the supplier flexibility. So it's about the what, not the how. Conformance or technical based ones are usually products. So you detail exactly what the product or service will be made of, like a recipe. Um, and the responses to a conformance spec, on the other hand, should have identical offerings. You often see this used in industries like pharmaceuticals and agriculture where you know the particular product, manufacturer, component, whatever is absolutely necessary. So the purpose of a specification is to firstly verify the need, which you can do with your internal stakeholder. You know, you're sitting with them and double checking that you know you've um, you've articulated their needs correctly. You do need to check this closely to make sure there's no errors. And if you spend some time on the specification, you may be able to get some value for money by taking things out that perhaps aren't needed. It results in goods or services that are appropriate. Remember I said before, it doesn't have to be the highest quality, it just needs to be fit for purpose which have then formed part of your contractual agreement. Now, the four functions of a specification is that it indicates what's fit for purpose, providing information of what is, is actually intended to be supplied with the purpose, quality and performance clearly stated. You can then clearly communicate that requirement to your user and also your supplier. And if in any case you end up with a dispute with the supplier, it helps you to provide evidence of what the performance standard should have been. Now on the screen, you can see um, the information that we include in a contract. And a lot of this does come from the specification, like the description, quality, packaging, quantity. But you'll also have things like the delivery requirements and price, the payment terms, the overall terms and conditions and the length of the contract what currency and law will govern the contracts, the ownership of any tooling that you might need, um, notice that you need to 
to give if you want to terminate the contract and what to do if you end up in a dispute. So coming back to the specification, um, it's really important that you verify the specification. Um, so have a think about what you think could happen if the specification wasn't verified, just for a second. Well, I think what could happen is that you end up with the wrong product being delivered, which could ultimately cause damage to machinery if it was a component being used in a machine. A quality failure to a product, so I don't know, sending the wrong flour, it needed to be self-raising and it was plain that would probably cause a quality failure if you were making cakes. The end user would probably reject the stock, which would lead to loss of sales and reduced profits. Something that um, no organization can really afford to bear. Then what would happen is the stock would run out and you'd have some downtime where there was no available um, stock to, to deliver that product or service. You'd waste time raising replenishment orders and paying invoices that are incorrect or even returning goods. Then you've got the time spent correcting those errors, but I think the worst of all is the loss of reputation by failing to serve your suppliers. Um, another important thing to think about in your sourcing process is how you're going to measure the effect of that contract. So start thinking very early on before you even ask suppliers to give you a price, what the KPIs are going to be. So these are kind of the critical success factors to a contract. They need to be, quant they need to be measurable either quantitatively or qualitatively, that's numbers or opinions. But when creating your KPIs, they need to be smart, which we'll look at on the next slide. Limit the number of KPIs so that the most important areas are focused on. If you give the supplier too many KPIs to look at, they won't know what's important to you. So the flow you can see on the screen now asks you to think about establishing the criteria, making sure that the, um, what you're measuring fits with the organisation's strategic vision. Then to go off and collect the data and the person that collects the data is the person who has easiest access to the data. Um, evaluate that, think about how you'd like it presented as well, um, share the results and implement any changes. But make sure you know that the data is readily available um, and that the supplier is going to understand what it is you're trying to achieve. So um, objectives need to be smart, as I've said before, that stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound. So being specific is explaining exactly what you want to achieve. Being measurable is to ensure that the way you check it um, can be measured from a sort of starting point to where you are today. Make it achievable, so certainly or obtainable, make sure it's something that can happen rather than it's totally out of reach. Make it relevant so it ties in with your goals and time bound, time based to set a deadline for completion. The next step in the sourcing process is now to have a look at who's available to do this in the market. So the buyer surveys the market to gain a full understanding of the items they have been tasked to source and the potential suppliers. And the Porter's Five Forces model um, is used to analyse the structure and competitiveness of a market. There are five forces, supplier power, buyer power, threat of new entrants, threat of substitutes, and competitive rivalry in the middle. Now the price of the product or service is gonna be determined by the profitability of the businesses. And that's the way to exert power in an industry. So if we start at the top, we've got the threat of new entrants. These are, um, this is a market known as um, imperfect competition or hyper competition. Essentially, there are not many barriers to entry, which means that new competitors can come onto this particular market, but they need to offer something different. 
so the products are slightly different. If you take, say, um, fast food eateries like McDonald's and KFC and Burger King, they all offer quite different products that would uh, tempt customers one way or the other. Um, and you'll always get sort of small um, eatery setting up to compete with them. Um, if we go to the left, power of the buyers, this is a situation known as perfect competition where we have many buyers, many suppliers. But the difference between that and the threat of new entrants is the products are the same rather than different. So, you know, you could literally get in an MOT for your car, for example, could be done by any, any particular MOT garage. We move to the bottom. This is a situation, um, threat of substitutes that we often call an oligopoly or a duopoly. This is where there's um, two or a few suppliers that dominate the market. So a good example might be Sky Virgin or Apple and Samsung two dominant players that do, sort of dominate that market there could be a few other smaller ones but they're the big guys um, essentially they don't really compete on price and they definitely compete with offering different products different functionality um, and there's high barriers to entry unlike the one at the top because there's a lot of technology or setup costs involved in these sorts of industries and the final one on the right, the power of the supplier um, is a situation known as a monopoly where there's only one supplier and essentially they control the market. They say what, when, how and how much. So the, the bit in the middle, this rivalry amongst the competitors is almost like a ball that could be squeezed. Um, the more um, forces that exist in the market, the smaller that rivalry will be. Um, so that's just the, the fifth and final force. Now, once we know who we want to work with, or there's a list of potential suppliers, um, the next step is to appraise them. And we do this by um, using a model like Carter's 10 C's, which you can see on the screen. This is essentially um, 10 things that start with the letter C that help us to indicate whether the bidder is suitable. It's about the bidder, not the bid. So we look at things like uh, competency. We want to make sure that they can actually supply what we uh, want them to supply. Um, we also look at things like capacity. So they may be a very competent supplier, but they might not have the capacity to serve you. Commitment will look at their commitment to quality, which is really easily assessed if the supplier has ISO 9001 accreditation. Control um, will look at whether or not they're in control of their suppliers, having kind of back to back terms with their supply chain so that procurement can be continuous. Cash looks at their financial position. Could they survive if the economy was not strong? Then you've got cost, which looks at whether the supplier is offering a fair cost, considering things like transport and packaging. Consistency will judge whether or not the supplier is able to deliver the same product time after time. And you may, for example, take up good references here. Culture looks at cultural compatibility. Um, you know, you want to make sure that the, there's a sort of cultural fit in your beliefs, values and strategies. Um, so body shop, as an example, um, don't test on animals it's unlikely they would work with a supplier that didn't um, have the same, the same values and beliefs. Clean looks at their green credentials and what they're doing to be friendly to the environment, which again can be judged very easily with an ISO 14001 accreditation or equivalent. And communication is the final one. We're looking at whether or not the supplier is able to communicate with you when you need them to. It considers computer systems, whether they're compatible, working hours, language barriers, those types of things. But the supply um, appraisal is a continuous process. It should happen before you award the contract, but also as part of your sort of supplier relationship and contract management process while you're delivering those services, especially if you're awarding a contract that goes on beyond 12 months. And in terms of the things that could happen if you don't appraise suppliers is you end up with a supplier that may have um, financial problems, failure to deliver to you because they don't have capacity. You might then raise ethical concerns 
and end up with a bad reputation because you're associated with a supplier that also has a bad reputation. And the final thing, which I think is quite interesting, is sometimes suppliers don't think you're serious if you haven't taken them through an appraisal process. The next step is then to decide the sort of route that you're going to take to engage with the supplier. Um, you can do tenders or quotes, um, which you can see on the screen. Um, and information can be obtained from potential suppliers in a number of different ways. So quotes are a very informal process where you're used to exploring um, less complex requirements, whereas tenders are far more formal um, and you would use them for high value long term contracts, probably your outsourced contracts as well, widely used in the public sector. Two types of tenders, there's open and restricted. But there are more than that, but they're the main two types. Open is like advertising a job externally, but you're advertising a contract externally. Anybody that sees that advert can apply. Whereas a restrictive one would, would require two stages. Stage one would be um, a pre-qualification. And only then those that uh, are successful at the pre-qualification get invited to tender. Now, regardless of which tender process you run, um, you need to make sure that you're administering it fairly. Um, suppliers should be given the opportunity to ask questions. And if, if they do ask questions, the answers should be shared with everybody. Um, set the deadline. So let's say it's 12 o'clock next Friday for the deadline um, and everybody should be driven to the same date. If you are giving a supplier um, an extension to that, if somebody's come up with a genuine reason why they need longer, then you need to um, extend the same courtesy to everybody. Um, and then what to do if you get an error in your bid. If, if, if all suppliers are able to provide the correct information, a bid with mistakes can be rejected. If all other suppliers are able to meet your deadline, a late arriving bid can be rejected. And if a supplier submits a bid with incorrect information or pricing, it could result in problems for the supplier if you accept the bid. So what you should do if you notice the error is to contact the supplier and ask them if they want to stand by or withdraw their bid. But you really shouldn't give them an opportunity to, to change it. Okay, so you can see the tender process on this slide. Um, there are four stages you go through. Um, the first step is to prepare it, which is to pull together all the documentation um, in order for the supplier to provide you with a full response. Engage with the departments as well and just make sure everything's correct and you've, you know, you've captured everything you need to. Process bit is to publish it, and um, this is where you deal with the sort of questions and answers and treat everybody the same way, ensuring transparency and fairness. And then evaluate those responses, you know, look at the um, price and non price factors just to see whether or not you, um, you're selecting the right supplier. It depends on the evaluation criteria you've published in your tender. If you're saying it's on price, then lowest price will win. But if it's a combination of price and non-price factors, you should have a cross-functional team evaluating the non-price criteria um, just to make sure that there's no sort of bias going on. And the final stage, once you've you know, received ratification to proceed, you award the contract to notify both the successful and the unsuccessful suppliers. It's really important that you give feedback to the unsuccessful as well. Um, and there's just a, you know, a, a, a table on the screen that shows you the differences between tenders and quotes. So one's formal, one's informal, one's more public, one's more private high value versus low value, complex versus standard. I mean, it's quite easy to, to just read and digest that in your own leisure. Now, everything we've spoken about can actually be done electronically. So e-procurement, e-sourcing, e-purchasing, anything with the letter E in front of it refers to the, the process being electronic. Now, the e-sourcing stuff at the front end um, looks at tasks like storing knowledge, creating the specification, running the tender or the quote, negotiating and evaluating, and then 
agreeing who to award the contract to. Using the electronic system offers improved productivity for efficiency, but systems are quite expensive to install. E-purchasing on the left hand side are tasks that are carried out electronically to select and requisition, authorise um, orders, send orders, receive and receipt them onto your system to say that the goods have been received and finally to pay your suppliers. And there are benefits and drawbacks to this. I mean, in terms of the benefits and advantages, it's a much quicker process. Confidentiality is maintained because all of these um, systems need a um, logon and password. You, you will reduce the errors because the system can identify silly mistakes that you might make. Um, helps to control your inventory because it may, may, for example, have sort of barcodes and stuff where it's looking at your stock holding. Um, less manpower required and allows you to globally source because it doesn't matter where you are in the world, um, you can access it using the internet. You don't need to physically read a, a local newspaper or a trade journal to, to see the opportunity. But the downside is that, you know, you do lack face to face contact, which could have a detrimental effect on the relationship. You've got the price to install the technology, which can be quite expensive. So you're going to need a lot of activity going through um, your portal to warrant the expense. You do become reliant on the technology and you need to make sure it's secure because it's holding a lot of sensitive information like designs and pricing. And it can be difficult to evaluate remote suppliers that are bidding because you've opened up the opportunity for global sourcing. Okay, transparency and fairness um, with suppliers is very important. It's not ethical to favour one supplier over another. So transparency just means operating in a way that everyone can see the actions that have been performed. And fairness is ensuring that all suppliers are treated equally. Suppliers should be chosen only because they're the best supplier to do the job and no other reason. So on the diagram on the screen, you can see some positive and negative inputs to um, transparency and fair procurement. So confidentiality is about treating information you receive from suppliers with confidence. Ethical behaviour, treat them all in the same way. And you must be accountable for your actions and decisions. The negative inputs look at things like bribery, which is when a buyer is swayed towards making a decision that's favouring one supplier over others, the use of power, which I'll cover shortly, and corruption, which is a form of unethical and dishonest behaviour. And the ones on the left and the right is um, firstly debriefing, which I've covered that in terms of the final stage of your sourcing process. You need to give feedback to suppliers and debrief them as to why they were or weren't successful. And on the right hand side, it's about reliability. And this is doing what you promise to do when you promise to do it. And if you're having problems meeting a deadline, it's really um, quite simple that you communicate with the stakeholders or the suppliers and just let them know that there's going to be a delay, why there's a delay, and when you're likely to get back to them rather than just leaving them hanging. Okay, um, we're now looking at the five types of power. Um, so this comes from French and Raven. Um, this is a form of corruption, which was one of the um, negative inputs from the transparent process on the previous slide. And power can either be referenced, which is where um, it's based on admiration from team members. And you've managed to get referent power through reputation and respect. Or it can be legitimate by virtue of your status within the organisation. Expert power comes from people that have got a specific knowledge or skill. And coercive power is exercised when you're forcing someone to do something. Reward power is when you delegate responsibility to somebody and reward them from, for, from carrying out that responsibility on your behalf. OK, we're now going to talk about auctions. Auctions have a place in e-sourcing. It's, um, uh, it's part of, it shouldn't replace your e-sourcing process. So once you've got down to a, a manageable shortlist of suppliers that can do the work, 
um, and you wouldn't mind who won it, it really does then come down to the best price. Um, now you can bring a supplier into an electronic reverse auction, reverse meaning that the price goes down, not up. And it works pretty much the same as eBay, but in reverse. So if you are selling something on eBay, you may start the price low um, and it will go up and up and up depending on how many people are trying to buy it. If one person buys it, the price stays low and they win it. With a reverse auction, a business would publish a sort of ceiling limit, actually. It will start high, usually the baseline. So if something costs you um, £100,000 today, that would be your ceiling limit. And the bidders will come in and drop below the 100,000 mark and say, I don't know, 99, 98, 97. I mean, you've got some examples here on the screen where the quote came in at a particular price per unit. And they ran an auction and um, managed to get them to reduce their price um, by competing with the, with the other suppliers rather than with themselves. So you can see here that... Um, that the person that gave the cheapest price in the beginning was company A with £13. But after the auction, actually, the winner switched to, to company B, who went down to 11 The auction takes place between the buyer and supplier on an electronic platform. The process is fair and transparent. Anyone entering onto the auction has the same amount of time to submit the bid. And they can see bid progress and are aware of when the auction is ending or due to end. There's many ingredients, in my opinion, to use to make an auction successful. You need to have um, a very clear specification so bidders are bidding on a like for like basis. You need enough suppliers, at least two, but more if possible. You need enough spend to warrant it being worth the supplier's while in sort of embracing this approach. And you need capacity in the market. So it's pointless trying to do this at a time when there's literally no availability in the market. You'll just get incredibly high prices. So in terms of the advantages and disadvantages, the buyer can stipulate the format of the bids. The supplier allows open communication between the buyer and suppliers. You can ask questions during a live auction. Reduces overheads and sellers can bid from anywhere in the world, which is an obvious positive approach. The downside is that the supplier will reduce their profits in order to be competitive. Your procurement team need to develop, collate and present the full specs in advance. There's a huge amount of work up front and there's a potential for error if the spec is unclear, but my view is that could happen in a in a traditional tender, not just in, in an auction. And we're now going to look at transition and mobilisation arrangements. So this is kind of like the end of the sourcing process before you, your new contract goes live. Um, and it doesn't always apply. You don't always need transition and mobilisation. It's only really when you're either moving from one supplier to another or there's a, a huge amount of activity that needs to happen before the contract goes live. So setting up a lot of manuals or processes. So transitional mobilization is the process of shifting a contract from one supplier to another in preparation for a go live date. So communication is really key here because you need to make sure suppliers have a clear understanding of the responsibilities and obligations during that period. So the mobilisation period is that sort of few months prior to the contract going live, after you've signed the contract, but before it goes live, you need to do um, a certain, certain number of things to get ready for it. Now, there are some potential issues that arise if arrangements don't go to plan. So if you leave the time um, too short, you could be in a situation where... Um, neither of the suppliers deliver because the, the old one stops delivering and the new one's not quite ready. If it's too long though, you could end up with um, multiple suppliers supplying you, which is double the cost. Other potential implications is for manufacturing organisations, works could stop and buying organisations are unable to serve their customers. 
and you could end up with lost revenue, duplicate orders from old and new suppliers, increasing the cost of paying your warehouse staff and everything else. So it's something that really needs to be managed carefully. That's the end of learning outcome two. Thanks for watching today.